Hello folks and welcome to tonight's uh, Pastor's Reflection. A few years ago, four or five years ago, uh, Lynn and myself were in America visiting my brother and his family and we had a few days in New York and uh, it was over a weekend so on the Sunday morning we uh, went to Brooklyn Tabernacle where Pastor Jim Simbola is the minister there and has been there for many years, done a tremendous work, a number of books that he has written, a uh, really humble, uh, gracious, uh, spirit-filled man who has developed a work in Brooklyn from virtually nothing. It's a tremendous uh, testimony, well worth reading. And uh, tonight we are going to have a recent uh, uh, sermon from Jim Simbola, and uh, recorded last month, just before the American election, and it's uh, Based on Isaiah 6, verses 1 to 8, well-known passage, uh, God is on the throne. And he's looking at the aspects of the security that Isaiah, the mature prophet, um, has in God, but also the absolute holiness of God, the righteousness of God, and the, the fact that God wants us to participate in his uh, kingdom purposes, that uh, he's looking for men and women, young people, to commit themselves to say, here am I, send me. And uh, it's a powerful word and uh, one well worth uh, uh, listening to and reflecting on. At the end of uh, his preach, there's a, a link to uh, the world famous Brooklyn Tabernacle Choir and uh, they're going to be singing one of their songs, Ever Praise, which will get your feet tapping and uh, just a tremendous gospel uh, song to finish. So be blessed in Jesus' name. So I was planning to preach uh, for this Sunday, November 1. Uh, I had like three different messages that were, I think, cooking inside of me, three different passages. And then they all kind of went dry on me in terms as I prayed. Because I want to Look, I'm supposed to preach the word of God to you. Paul tells Timothy, preach the word. I'm supposed to break down the word of God and feed you good food, right? But what food? From where? Does God care? Or can I just pick any old passage and say, let's break it down, the Hebrew and the Greek, and no, there's a word, a timely word. I believe that with all my heart. So... Out of nowhere, as I'm waiting, God, what should I give the people or, or talk about? God opens up a passage that not only ministers to me, but I get this witness, I believe, of the Spirit. Tell the people this story. Tell them. Tell them what I've taught you about it. So here goes. Famous chapter in the Old Testament, Isaiah 6. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and exalted seated on a throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphim, the only mention of that word in the Bible. It means uh, fiery ones, or burning ones, burning ones. Some angelic being that is part of the vision that uh, Isaiah has here of the Lord seated on his throne. Each seraphim had six wings. With two wings they covered their face, in humility, two were, they covered their feet as if unseemly, and with two they were flying, and they were calling to one another, loud, holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and the thresholds shook and the temple was filled with smoke. We're talking about a whole lot of stuff going on here. We're talking about seraphim so loud, so triumphant, the scene so glorious that everything is rocking and rolling and shaking and trembling, and now uh, smoke, not from a smoke machine. No, we have too many of those down here. Uh, this, is, this is supernatural smoke in heaven. At the sound of their voices, everything shook and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried. I am ruined. 
For I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. And my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. Fiery coal, which he had taken from this heavenly altar. With it he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, how many of you know the rest? Why did, why did Isaiah answer? Anyone know? Here am I. Send me. So those are the first eight verses of Isaiah, the sixth uh, chapter. Isaiah was a prophet, but his commissioning here does not happen in the first chapter. It waits till the sixth chapter. And we have this famous panorama from the heaven, of heaven, where Isaiah goes through this fresh new experience with God. Now, let's get it historically in place, and then let's see what we can learn from it. Isaiah was a prophet. What was a prophet? A prophet was one who delivered God's word to the people. Sometimes foretold things, but always was speaking when they spoke in the name of the Lord what God was saying to a given situation. So Isaiah was no new believer uh, and wet behind his ears. This was a, a, a mature man of God. He says that in the, king, in the year that King Uzziah died, who was King Uzziah? Well, King Uzziah was one of the longest reigning kings in the history of the southern kingdom of Judah. You remember that after Solomon, there was a civil war and the country split in two. The northern ten tribes were called Israel or Ephraim and the southern kingdom was called the kingdom of Judah, which had Jerusalem and the throne and the temple there. So Isaiah has a vision in the year that King Uzziah died. Uzziah reigned for 52 years, and now he dies. So what's happening on the street? What's the word? Everyone's saying, Que pasa? Que paso? Que pasará? What will happen now? What's going to happen? The main guy, 52 years, and he was basically a good king, although he had an unfortunate kind of end to his life. But he, had, he was a good king. Now what's going to happen? You know, like our country is a buzz, election day coming up, a couple of days. What's going to happen? What's going to happen? Who will replace him? Will it be one of his sons? Will the military try to do a coup? Will someone attack now when we're vulnerable and our beloved king is gone? Like, what's going to happen? What's going to happen? In the year that King Uzziah died, in a time of worry and conjecture and all kinds of what if, He saw the Lord. He got a vision of heaven. He's way above now pitiful little Jerusalem and New York and Washington and all that. Whoa, whoa, now he's in the big leagues. He goes up and he sees the Lord. <clears throat> and he sees the Lord seated on a throne. Not a throne in Jerusalem, a throne in heaven. What stability, what rest, what confidence for Isaiah now. He's not worrying now who's going to be the next king. He said there is a king of kings 
and he's seated on the throne. He rules and reigns over America and Israel and, and Cambodia and Nigeria and, and Argentina. Every place in the world, the king, God, the Lord, he's sitting and nothing can happen unless he permits it. And he will have the final word. And now a new security comes into Isaiah. Because if you look on the earth, you can get nervous or depressed or sick to your heart with what goes on around the world, including this country. But when you see him, when you're walking with that heart vision of God on the throne, Wow, it changes everything. The Lord reigneth. Blessed be the rock. The Lord reigns. He's on the throne. Nobody's doing anything unless God permits it. And then God, he raises up one. He sets down another. He just, it's all, the people are like ants on the earth, the Bible says in, in the book of Isaiah, the same book. So, what security now? Do you need that today? Are, are you looking just on earth and all wrapped up in that and getting all hyperventilated? Or can you see the, the king on the throne? Not people who come and go. Do you remember who the president was when the depression began in the stock market crash in 1929? Do you remember who it was? Some of you don't know your history. You don't, you don't remember that. Nobody will remember who's the president now if it goes on, the, the, the world goes on. Nobody. What we think is like the end of the world, it's just, it's on and on and on and on. But the ultimate king, he rules, he reigns. And now Isaiah is, oh, I'm good to go now. The, the, the Lord reigns. He's seated on that throne. But, it's not just security. It's not just security that he sees that throne and the stability that that brings. Now the atmosphere is charged with something else. Not just power and the sovereign God ruling and reigning. The seraphim are flying around there and they're shouting out, listen, Holy, holy, holy. Now, in the Hebrew language, the repetition of the word is what is used to bring uh, emphasis. So in the Hebrew language, it's not translated that way. The translators know what they're trying to do. So in the Hebrew, it might say heavy, heavy about something, which would mean very heavy. Bright, bright, exceedingly bright. You get it? Now, to bring emphasis, which words can't even fathom, it's, it's, it's a three-time repeated, not double. Holy, holy, holy. God is holy. The king of kings and the one who reigns on the throne that will never be cast down. And he'll never go off that throne. He rules to the end forever and ever and ever and ever. The whole thing is holiness, purity, no lying, pure love, purity, nothing unclean, nothing immoral, nothing hate-filled. Oh, just... The atmosphere of it with the seraphim crying out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord. It overwhelms the prophet. The prophet doesn't walk around and go, yeah, I knew that. God is holy. I've been telling people that. No, he's having an experience. What we need today in this new day of challenge is a fresh experience of God and his holiness. Holy. He's holy. That's a bad word. Now in most churches and all that, we're so afraid people might not come back if we point out there's such a thing as sin. The holiness of God is played down like, but we just remember he loves you no matter what you do. You just keep holding up those banks and robbing people blind. You know, no one's perfect. 
That's not what the Bible teaches. Thank God he's full of mercy. But here right now, he, what's pictured to us is the, the incredible holiness of God that breaks the prophet. So he not only has gained stability and confidence that God is on the throne, that you don't have to go to bed at night biting your nails, God is on the throne. But now personally, he goes, woe is me. See, when we live in God's presence, we don't go, woe is you. We go, woe is me. You can always tell when someone has been with the Lord and a mature Christian. They're not going, woe is you. They're not posting diatribes and attack mode uh, uh, content against another person. No, they're too caught up with their own undoneness. Now, Isaiah belonged to the Lord. This was no guy selling Oxycontin on Fulton Street. This was a prophet. But when you get into God's presence, you see not other people's faults, you see your own. That is a rule you can just take. Whenever someone's just talking about whatever everyone else is doing, what's wrong, they're not real close to God. Because you get close to God, you get quiet about that, and you talk mostly about, oh, thank God for his mercy. It's me, oh Lord, standing in the need. You know, I, I told you that story about one time I was sitting in, uh, I was sitting in uh, my study back in the house I lived in in Queens, and I was reading a Bible, and I had some dockers on and jeans or something on, and I was just sitting there, and the, the light was shining through the blinds on a summer morning, and I had my New Testament on, uh, in front of me, and the sun was shining right on my pants, just like now. And uh, I was there, and that light was, woo, like 10 in the morning, 10.30 in the morning, a July Saturday. And I closed the Bible. Someone called me. We were talking, they said something very funny, and I went, that's incredible. And I went like that. The light was shining bright on my pants. Suddenly, when I hit my pants, do you know that about 7,856 creatures of some kind left my pants and went up in the air? Was it dust? Was it spirogyra? Were they amoebas? I don't know what they were. But these pants had just been laundered, clean, and I was wearing them, and I thought they were clean. And when I hit that, I realized, yo, there's a colony living in my left leg. But I only knew that because the bright light shining on it, if I would hit it now, you see, that, that's coming out of that, that pants leg right now. It's just there's not enough light to show it. You get it? That sunlight did a number on me. I actually stopped and went, yo, I can't believe this. I'm walking around like a derelict here. It's the light. Isaiah saw the bright light of God's holiness, and he didn't say, woe is you. He said, woe is me. Who can think about another person when you're in God's presence? How could you do that? So, I better put this back where it was because they won't let me come back here anymore. This says French horn. This is where a French horn plays in this orchestra in this great church. We've never had a French horn. Um, we've had French pastry in our church, but never a French horn. So this is amazing now. He gains confidence and stability by God on the throne, but then at the same time, <laughs> for God to use us, he has to break us first. When you're full of yourself and self-righteousness, and when I think I'm better than everyone else and the best pastor and the best preacher and I could judge everyone, then God just says, just go on the side. He resists the proud, the self-righteous. He gives grace to the humble. So never be afraid when God shows you. And notice God shows you our, our own um, waywardness. Notice what he says here, though. 
For I am a man of, I've shot people, I kill people, I do drugs, I sell drugs to children, I, 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 um, and then a lot of other ugly things I don't want to mention. No. Notice what he says. I'm a man of unclean lips. It suddenly dawned on him, and I dwell in the midst of an unclean people with unclean lips. In other words, talking and his lips are the first thing that he mentions in, in the presence of God. How I have talked out of line. How I have said things. Oh, God, now that I'm in your presence, I am a woe is me. Not woe is you. Woe is me. For I am a person of unclean lips. And I live among a people of unclean lips. And now my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. So in this encounter for the election day season that we want with God, it's to see him on the throne so we don't get all bent out of shape by the political winds that go around and have always gone around and will always go around. How can people who don't know the Lord and basically are walking in the dark according to the Scripture, how are they going to lead the country to light? I mean, just think of that. How can the dark and the blind lead people? They're all going to fall in a ditch. So now he sees stability and confidence, but now there's brokenness. Now he's in a good place. Now that coal comes to his lips. Notice Fire is never used as an agent of cleansing in the Old Testament. It's blood. But this, uh, this fire that comes to his lips is a kind of blanket uh, statement of, it's okay, Isaiah. I've heard your confession. Your sin has been cleansed. And you are been accepted with me because of your faith and your humility and repentance. And now I, I sanction that and with touching your lips, which was the part he felt so unclean about. And now the most amazing thing. He has fresh confidence. He has a fresh brokenness. Did you know one time I was in a service as college age but God was dealing with me. The service was so full of the Holy Spirit. I went forward to pray. I waited on God. People prayed with me. I was so conscious of God that I ended up at the end of the meeting going to some friend's house, older than me. And they were having bagels with cream cheese and butter on a Sunday night in Brooklyn. My heart was so conscious of God's holiness I was so sensitive and broken that as they began to talk at the table, the conversation turned to something critical and gossipy and slander. And I remember, as God is listening to me, I remember feeling so uncomfortable. And then I could feel tears coming to my eyes. And I excused myself and I walked down this long corridor that the house was, a kind of railroad apartment like I grew up in. And then I went to the front room kind of like a living room where no one was. And I remember just, oh God, forgive them for talking like that. And I just don't want to be around that. Right now I praise you, I honor you. That's what happens when you're conscious of God. When you're not conscious of God, you join in with it and you just do any old thing. But now his lips have been touched by that coal of fire. And now the most amazing thing, in the middle of the change of the king, in the middle of the election cycle, in the middle of whatever, they had no elections back then, his son Jotham became the next king. He, the Bible says about him, he was a fairly good king, but the people drifted away to idolatry. Why? Because no king, no president can do one thing to change one human heart in America. Did you know that? Not one. We had Clinton, we had Bush before that senior, had Clinton, had Bush, had Obama, uh, President Obama, had Trump. Not one of them changed one human heart in the entire country. And out of the heart comes the issues of life. So now let's listen to what Isaiah heard, because this is what really is happening right now. Right now this is happening. 
this almighty God says the strangest thing. The king who sits on the throne, whose glory is overwhelming, whose holiness transcends anything Isaiah could imagine. <clears throat> God almighty says, who will go for us? Who can we send? In other words, the people are wayward. The people are lost. The people worship idols. The people don't care about me. The people are heading to their own destruction, but I love them and I want to help them. So who will go for me? Who can go for us? A collective plural of I, us. Like they're in a conference room. If God has all that power, why does he just do whatever he's going to do? Remember this now. If God has all power, what's he got to say? Who will go for us? Who can we send? Just God, do it. You're on the throne. You're holy, 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 trice holy. No, God has arranged it that whatever's going to be done here on earth, he's going to have to use human instruments. Can you believe that? And it's not in the political realm or the finance realm, banking realm. Media realm. That's not he's what he's looking for. He's looking for servants, messengers. Who can we send? Who will go for us? Imagine that. Oh, God is on the throne. I've heard that all my life. God is on the throne. I, I got that. I got it. But God on the throne is still saying, who will go for us? Whom can we send? No, pastor. God doesn't need humans. That's not what it says here. It says here, who will go for us? Whom can we send? There has to be some cooperation here with humanity. So, I want to close now. And I want us all to be able to have a new stability, a new brokenness. It's good for us. A new humility. You know, none of us are all that. Let's stop doing woe is you. How about woe is me? but a fresh surrender. You know what Isaiah says when he hears it? Here I am. Here am I. Send me. Now, he was a prophet, so he already had had some surrender to the Lord. You're not a prophet and never have surrendered to the Lord. But you see, when you get a fresh revelation of God, a new experience of God in his glory, there's a fresh consecration. Why don't you and I do that old-fashioned word? It's not old-fashioned in the Bible. It's, it's always in vogue. Consecrate ourselves. Say to God, I ain't much. And my lips were sure unclean. And I got a lot of warts and mistakes in me, but thank you for your mercy. And I don't have time to be going, woe is you. You just heard me say, woe is me. But God, you need someone? You need someone? Here am I. Here am I. Send me. You say, but I'm not a prophet. That doesn't apply to us. Yes, it does. It applies to all of us. The church in the New Testament grew not because of the ministry of the apostles alone, but every place they were scattered, we learn in Acts, they spoke the word of the gospel. They told the story of Jesus. How will they know on your block? They'll know, to, they'll know on Wednesday who won the election, probably, although the thing could drag out. They'll know who won the election, but that won't help them. Not for eternity. No, no, no. This election has nothing to do with eternity. People who say, here am I, send me. We can alter people's eternity. Imagine God, I say carefully. I, I, this sounds almost sacrilegious, but I want to say it here. God has made it that he needs us. You go into the world and preach the gospel, he told the disciples. No, God, you, you sit on a throne, you have all power, spread the word. No, you do it. He's not looking for ability. He's not looking for high IQ. Oh, that would disqualify me and a lot of other folks. He's looking for availability. He's looking for Isaiah spirit. 
Here am I, send me. Lord, here we are today. Help us to be biblical Christians who really know you. Help us not to worry and wonder about the future, but help us to know that you're on the throne. That you rule, you reign. Nothing's happening, not one thing, unless you permit it. And you're going to bring it to your conclusion at your timing. Help us, Lord, also to be conscious how unlike we are from you. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Keep us with that brokenness of a contrite heart, contrite spirit. Remember what your choice apostle Paul called himself at the end of his life. At first he said he was least of the apostle, least of the saints. But the more he walked with you, he finally said, I'm the chief of sinners. So we thank you for salvation. We're clean, we're pure. And yet at the same time, we're broken inside because we realize it's all by your mercy. And we need that heart if we're going to be messengers for you so that we don't talk down to people, but we plead with them. Oh, that you might know the Jesus I know. Help us today, Jesus, to be the ones that say, here am I, send me. I say that to you today. I've been serving you for a while, but I say afresh, here am I, Jim Symbol, Lord. Here am I. Here am I, send me. Open my mouth, show me what to say. Send me where I need to go. Let me help someone with even a glass of water. But Lord, I want to be used by you, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.